Thank you all for coming. What a great turnout, and uh, we appreciate y'all being here and, and your enthusiasm towards uh, uh, FHCAM and, and this Stuka project. And we hope to, to give you what you're after here. We're going to uh, do a lot of Stuka talking. Um, basic overview of the event is that uh, uh, we have uh, Todd Shaffron here, who's our researcher, and uh, he'll be giving a talk about the history of the airplane, of this specific airplane. And uh, I'll be back up to talk about the restoration and all the steps it took uh, from uh, basically the recovery of the aircraft all the way up to uh, today, to this moment right now. And then uh, we also have a, a large group of the airframe and systems restores from Hungary, uh, which I'll be talking a lot about and uh, introducing, and then we'll invite them up. And at the very end, we'll have a question and answer session where you could ask uh, Todd, myself, and, and some of the restorers uh, just anything you're curious about. Um, so back to high level, uh, behind me you see a, uh, a Junkers JU-87R4 Stuka, which was a German dive bomber during World War II and arguably one of the most uh, iconic aircraft of World War II in any of the theaters. And it's really amazing that you guys uh, are able to, to see it here today. Um, before, uh, uh, earlier today, we were allowing you guys to get up on the uh, uh, stairs there and look inside the Stuka, and we'll get back to that. Uh, so after we're done talking in the Q&A, we'll open that back up. So if you haven't had a chance to look inside the airplane, uh, you will later. Um, and then uh, also over here we have some exhibits. There's restored parts that um, uh, IAMF, the, the Hungarian resorts, have completed that are ready to go in the airplane. Uh, there's original Stuka parts there, some of which will be going back inside the aircraft, and then some that are just more like relics, and, and we've tried to label those. But if you have any questions, we'll be around afterwards and are happy to walk through that with you um, as well. Uh, items to note are the BK-37 cannon uh, behind the table there that they used on the late model Stukas. Um, we believe that's the only example in the world that's original with the fairings, the gun, uh, it's original inside, so it's a really unique piece. And then um, also I'd like to point out the 500 kilogram bomb uh, to my left over here, and uh, that would be the, the larger size bomb that they would hang in the center of the aircraft. So um, lots of great stuff. Um, because I'm the stand-in welcoming address, I've got a note here uh, that says shameless plug. So hang on, I'm gonna get through that. FHCAM is, is now a, a nonprofit, and as part of that, as part of uh, what Paul's vision was for this place was to become a nonprofit self-sustaining uh, uh, collection of artifacts that can educate and uh, give you guys an experience. And um, so part of that is now taking donations uh, to become self-sustaining. So this is my shameless plug to remind you that uh, if you'd like to make a donation to the JU87 Stuka project, you can do that in the gift shop right where you checked in. Without uh, any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Todd to come up and go through the uh, history of work number 6234, which is our airplane. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. And welcome all of you to, to this uh, session this morning. I'm a volunteer at the museum. I've uh, been doing research on these aircraft since uh, 2009. Most of the ones that you see in the museum and some that aren't yet here, um, I've wrestled with their particular histories. So it's been a lot of fun, uh, although this is the first talk that I've given. So let's see how it goes. Um, this is going to be the operational history of this aircraft, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the type itself. Um, between the restorers and uh, Jason, we should be able to answer many of your questions about that aspect of it. But this is really focused on where this aircraft operated, uh, what the context of the times were, and how it ended up uh, on the frozen tundra for 40-some, 50-some years. So first of all, dive bombing. Uh, there was shallow dive bombing, I guess you could say, in World War I. Uh, coming out of that war, uh, various militaries experimented with dive bombing, especially the United States, Japan, 
and also, as it turns out, Germany. And out of that came three very iconic dive bombers. And these were, uh, these came to fruition in the 20s, mostly in the 30s. So we got the Stuka on the left there. And then this is the uh, Daiichi Bao, the Japanese. And then, of course, our own Dauntless dive bomber. And many people would debate which one is the most famous dive bomber of the war, uh, but all three of them did yeoman's work during the war. One of the reasons for dive bombing was that horizontal bombing was horribly inaccurate. And the way to put a bomb on a very precise target was to dive bomb on it. There was sh uh, shallow dive bombing, glide bombing, and then what the Stuka was involved in predominantly, which was uh, a very steep angle of attack. So the particular German experience with dive bombing grew out of a number of factors. First of all, the Germans didn't have a reliable bomb site until actually late in the war. So it made horizontal dive bombing problematic. They also didn't have the industrial infrastructure to produce a huge fleet of strategic bombers. And so they tended to have light, or, or medium, light and medium bombers in their fleet, didn't have the raw materials, didn't have the production capacity. Um, it wasn't until Hitler came to power in the early 30s that they actually brought the factories back into Germany because they were prohibited from having aircraft factories. So the few German aviation firms had satellite factories in Russia or in Holland, for example. The Luftwaffe really uh, came about as a support for the German army. And so from that standpoint, you can also understand why dive bombing was important because when you're trying to support the troops, you want to be bombing uh, with pinpoint accuracy. The head of, perch of procurement in the Luftwaffe, a fellow named Udet, and pardon me as I go through these German, Finnish, and Norwegian terms, I'm going to slaughter them all, but uh, bear, bear with me. Um, he championed the dive bomber, and there's a lot of four folklore about this. He uh, came to the U.S., supposedly saw demonstrations of dive bombing, uh, was su supposed to have purchased some biplane uh, dive bombers in the uh, early and mid-30s, although pinning, pinning the actual truth to, those, uh, to that folklore is a little more difficult. And then, of course, the uh, Stuka saw a limited service in the Spanish Civil War, but did demonstrate that it would be effective. And that was the crowning um, confirmation that for the Germans that dive bombing was the way to go. So if we, if we look at the Stuka in terms of what was a dive bombing operation, um, and this is, these are generalities from a Stuka pilot reminiscing uh, obviously, depending on the situation, there would be uh, differences in, in specific aspects of it, but it gives you a broad idea. First of all, they would be approaching the target at something like 5,000 meters, and they would extend the hydraulic uh, brake. They would view the target through a window in the forward part of the uh, lower fuselage, so they could actually look down, and when, when you get up onto the... Uh, fuselage here, to look down, you can see the square opening in the forward section. It doesn't have glass in it at this point, but you can see where it would be. And they would follow the target until it reached the, the back portion of that window. And at that point, they would begin the dive. Uh, they would maintain, but they'd do a 70 degree dive, which is pretty precipitous, and about 450 kilometers per hour. They'd keep the target in their um, uh, sight, as well as they would maintain the dive angle with marks that were um, etched on the starboard side of the canopy, so they could see that they were maintaining a 70-degree dive. They would preset their drop point, and a horn would sound when the altimeter reached that, that point. And then they would uh, hit the button on the control, control stick, bomb would release, and then that would also activate a hydraulic aid to help pull them out of the dive. So that's the basic characteristics of a, uh, of a Stuka dive bombing. 
So this particular Stuka is an R version, and I won't, well, I will try and slaughter this word. A Reich Weiten os which basically means an extended range or long range version. So early in the war, Polish campaign, they determined that they needed, a long, needed to enhance the range. And so out of the B2, there were A's, B's, now we moved to R's, uh, they, they created this longer range aircraft. Uh, there, was, there were several R's, this is the final uh, in the sequence, the R4. Uh, our particular aircraft was built in June of 1941. It's one of 145 R4s, of which 143 actually left the factory and went into the field. Two were lost in, uh, in early accidents. And these were built under contract. Uh, so Junkers themselves were busy building JU-88s. So Vesser uh, was enlisted to build these aircraft. And our particular aircraft was built in uh, Bremen. Bremen, Germany. Interestingly, um, the R4 was built with a tropical filter and, was, and so was painted as if it was going to the Mediterranean or the desert theater. It's got um, the desert colored upper surfaces and it had a tropical blue underside. And for those of you that are into that sort of thing, that would be RLM 79 and RLM 78. Those were the right aviation ministry's designations for those, those colors. Now, it's our belief that this aircraft never went south, it, that at this time period it was directed to the north and it would have been repainted at some point on the upper surfaces with the European, with the European color. It carried a factory code when it left the, the factory, and these were usually painted on the underside of the wing or on the fuselage. In the case of this aircraft, it was done on the fuselage. We believe it was TJ, and we know for sure that it was FD. Um, so we were continuing research to, make, to determine whether the TJ stands up to, to being true or not. But we believe at this point that it was TJ, FD. And that was a radio code that they would use until they got to their assignment. Once they got to their assignment, they received a tactical code that was put on the side of the aircraft. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So what was the general situation when this thing came out of the plant in June of 1941? Well, first of all, the Germans were victorious all throughout Europe, Poland, France, Denmark, Norway, a uh, little bit of a hiccup with the Battle of Britain, uh, victorious in the Balkans, captured Greece, uh, just starting to get active in the Western Desert. And in fact, Rommel has now driven uh, the British um, back from their early gains. There is a lull in the Western Desert right now. They've just done battle acts. They're getting ready for Crusader later in 1941. So that may be another reason why this aircraft didn't go south and instead went north. But certainly the reason it went north was because Germany was now focused on Russia. And Operation Barbarossa was going to start at the end of June 1941. The, this particular aircraft flew in two parts of Barbarossa. And those are the two um, operations that you see on the slide there. Reindeer and Silver Fox. Those cover the, the operations in the very far north of Russia. So this is your typical map of Barbarossa, and everybody is familiar with this area right here. This is the, the north, central, and southern parts of the, of the operation. <laughs> Millions of men, thousands of tanks, thousands of aircraft. But there was also an operation in the far north, and that's where this aircraft was involved. So if we zoom in on that, that portion of the map, this is where Finland, Russia, Norway, and Sweden to a certain extent come together up in the, in the far north. Here's a little bit closer view of, of the area. And the defining feature up here is Murmansk, which is right here. This is the Barents Sea up here, come up over Norway, is Murmansk and the Murmansk Railroad, which runs down along the peninsula and also the White Sea 
and down eventually to uh, Mother Russia. So in 1939, winter of 1939-40, the Finns and the Russians fight what is called the, uh, the Winter War. And in that, initially the, the Finns hold off the Russians, but eventually the Russians prevail. And in the course of that settlement, Russia gets this peninsula right here, much of Karelia, and puts it the border to the west. And that's going to play a key role in the upcoming uh, operation because the Germans are starting much further west than they would have had that, uh, had that defeat not occurred earlier. Just a word about the, the geography. So we, we start off in central, the central part of Finland here, which is heavily forested. And I'm going to read from a German um, general's post-war uh, recounting of the war in the north. This boundless forest is virtually unexplored. Throughout this trackless, desolate region, deepest solitude and deathly silence reign supreme. And in fact, the German soldiers were quite put off by that. The Finns who grew up in it, they knew how to deal with that. The timber becomes lighter and weaker the farther one goes north. So once we get out of this area, the densely forested area, we move into the higher, we're above the Arctic Circle, um, and until at last only scattered trees and bushes extend upward from inextricable tangle of large rocks. And in the far north, up against the Barents Sea, rocky ground covered with reindeer moss, lichens, blueberry, cranberry, and juniper bushes predominates in the, in the wilderness. So when you got to the far north, it's what we commonly call tundra. It was a very inhospitable place to wage a war. Very, very cold in the winter, like 30, 40, 50 degrees below zero. It was uh, humid, full of mosquitoes in the summertime. And in the intervening periods between winter and summer and summer and winter, uh, when the rains came, it was incredibly muddy. Very difficult to, to operate. So the objectives for the Germans initially was protect Norway. So remember, the invasion of, of Russia is get to Moscow as quickly as possible and, and uh, destroy as many Soviet troops as possible. But in the north, the objective was um, protect Norway and protect the Swedish ore fields and protect the nickel mines in Petsamo. It wasn't as much an aggressive objective. However, interesting, and so they wanted to cut the Murmansk Railroad to keep the Soviets from transferring forces to the north. Interestingly, that gets completely switched between the invasion in June and the uh, winter and spring of, of uh, early 42, because by that time, the Allies are sending tens of thousands of trucks, hundreds of aircraft, thousands of tanks on the convoys and down the Murmansk Railroad. So then the order goes out, cut the railroad, destroy the port facilities, and stop this reinforcement of the Soviet Union. And all of this plays a role in the way that the JU-87s and JU-88s are tasked during this period. So specifically, what were the Luftwaffe assignments? Well, they were to provide close air support, which was a typical assignment for the, uh, for the dive bombers destroy the port facilities, interdict the Murmansk Railroad, uh, knock out the Soviet airfields, and operate against the Soviet Navy in the Arctic Ocean. All things that you would think would be appropriate to do. However, they never are able to do them all at once. And you'll see as we go along here the reasons for that, but the priorities are constantly shifting uh, as to what, what gets done at any one particular time. So here is the Luftwaffe assignment for Barbarossa. There's 2,000 aircraft, of which 40 bombers are assigned to the far north. And of those, 30 are dive bombers. And that's just the authorized strength. So the actual number of JU-87s operating in the far north, if you look at the, some of the monthly rolls which are available, it might be 27 aircraft, might be 29 aircraft. 
The actual authorized strength of the group that went up there was probably 36, but they never that never would have attained that, the three squadrons with 12, 12 aircraft apiece. But you can see that this was a this was a backwater, viewed as a backwater, and it wasn't assigned a uh, very strong uh, force. Interestingly, if you count that wing way over there on the left, which is from another Stuka recovered in the far north, and this aircraft, uh, you're sitting next to about 8% of the Stuka strength in the far north on January 1st, 1942, which is quite something. So, what organization was this um, aircraft under? Well, it was under Task for Provisional Task Force Kirkanus. Kirkanus is a town in, in the far north of Norway, and that's where the command was uh, centered for this, not the not Hall of Luftwaffe 5, which is what the uh, overall umbrella was, but for this particular task force supporting operations in the far north. And it was made up of, and I use the word elements because because of just a handful. Elements of uh, JU-88 uh, unit, a BF-110 unit, uh, and a BF-109 unit, and then of course, uh, the Stuka unit, which was Lergeschwader, I hope I didn't botch that one too badly, one. Lergeschwader means a uh, training and test unit, but not in the sense that the guys were inexperienced. It was more in the sense that they were testing out tactics for a particular aircraft because it wasn't a uniform group, uh, a wing, pardon me. It com comprised uh, JU-88s and JU-87s, the fourth being the Stuka squadron, the fourth uh, group of Lergeschwader 1. Later on, in the uh, late fall of 41, this changes and becomes uh, Flagerfuhrer Nord Ost, which is uh, Air Command North and then the East. Here's a typical view of the Stukas in the far north. It's over, over the tundra. This is L1FW. This is L1FW. We believe this was the predecessor to this aircraft. So in a squadron, if you took a loss, Eventually, you would replace that aircraft uh, with a new aircraft. So we think this one came in just after this aircraft. And in a minute, I'll uh, talk about the, uh, the coding. But this, is, this shows the yellow F, the yellow wingtips, and the yellow under the F there. All of those, well, the, the wingtips and the fuselage band to denote the Russian theater, and the yellow on the F to denote the uh, 12th Squadron. So as I said, this, is, this was assigned to the 12th squadron of LG-1. How do we know that? Well, because the code is L1 plus FW. The last letter is the squadron, and W would be the 12th squadron. L1 stands for the, uh, the wing, that's Lergeschwader 1. And the F stands for the actual aircraft number. So A is 1, B is 2, C is 3. F would have been the sixth aircraft in that squadron. Jason's uh, restoration crew has taken the paint off of the fuselage in, la in layers to reveal what was underneath. And interestingly, uh, he's found CW underneath. So in trying to back into the operational history of this aircraft, we believe that and there's a question mark there because we can't confirm it, that for a short time, this aircraft was L1CW. And that fits in with the loss of other aircraft labeled L1CW. And then became L1FW uh, at the end of August and was in fact L1FW when it went down on the 24th of April, 1942. So when it, when it uh, arrives, when the aircraft arrives in the far north, and we believe that it, it either went up through the tail of Luftwaffe 5 in Norway, or it could have gone uh, directly from Germany into southern Finland, 
the Germans had a relationship with the Finns where they were allowed to, to stage stuff through a place called Pori in southern Finland. And they did receive a lot of reinforcements in August. So it is possible that this aircraft came in that way as well in August. But by this time, uh, so by the, by the middle of August, we've already had the invasion start, 22nd of June in, this, in the main part of, uh, of the campaign down south, and uh, end of June in the north. Because what, ha what had to happen first was the Soviet Union had to declare war on Finland first, and then the Germans moved in. And even though they had a kind of a quasi-relationship with the Finns, it, they didn't start the war up in the far north. So there was, there was a, a battle in the, in the far north, um, and, and then uh, they transferred units down into the central part of the campaign up in the far north, and then this aircraft shows up. And we have a logbook for L1FW, or showing flights of L1FW with these two gentlemen, uh, the pilot on the left, um, Tutsauer, and Rupke, the uh, radio man gunner in the back. It's, ap it's actually Rupke's book that we're using. So he records his first flight in L1FW in Aug on August 25th, uh, which is actually a transit flight from Kirkenes in Norway down to Rovaniemi in the center part of the, of, uh, the campaign. So it gets very confusing and it's not, it's not really germane to our talk today, but briefly I want to give you an idea of, of the uh, fire brigade style uh, activity that was going on here in the far north. So this is Kirkenes, Norway up here. This is Murmansk. This is Rovaniemi in Finland. This is the railway. There is no connection between these two areas. The only way to get back and forth here is you either fly or you go over the Arctic Highway and take the Arctic Highway up. So they were not mutually supporting these two campaigns, even though they were considered one. The Germans, because they didn't have enough aircraft, were constantly sending units back and forth, either operating out of Kirkenes, if it was dive bombers, or Rovaniemi. And so as you go month by month or week by week, you'll find that there two squadrons are here, one squadron is here, or three squadrons are here, and none are up here, or three aircraft have been left here, and the rest of the group is up here. But there's never enough aircraft in any one place to allow them to make the final push and take Murmansk or sever the railroad. They get part way, but not all the way. So if you keep in mind that Kirkenes is up here, Rovaniemi is here, I'm going to mention Kastanga, which is right here. They eventually operate from a frozen lake down here, and the railroad. So now we're working from the logbook, Rupke's logbook for L1FW. We're in August. They've moved the aircraft down to the south, the Rovaniemi. The Germans have attacked across the uh, frontier at Sala, and they're headed for Alakurdi, which is right here. And then ultimately, Kandalashka, which is over on the railroad over here. And so we have, in the logbook, we have um, recorded bombing missions where they hit a train near Alicurdy, they hit vehicles, or they hit troops. And they, because of the distance from Rovaniemi to Alicurdy, they actually make a stop in an intermediate airport on the way back. Which would indicate to me that, because it was a long-range aircraft with drop tanks, the fact that they were making that intermediate stop suggests to me that they weren't using the drop tanks, that they, they were fully bombed up, they went and did their mission, and then they stopped at the intermediate strip on the way back. Also during this period of time down south, so we were just talking about an, an area up here. So just below, um, there was a drive on a place called Louis, which is where uh, the railroad came through. And there's also records of uh, the aircraft bombing troop concentrations and a bridge near Castanga, which is where that red dot is. So there's an old proverb, it's like 800 years old, it says, for want of a nail, 
the shoe was lost for one of a shoe, the horse was lost for one of a horse, the knight was lost, and then they lose the battle and the war and the kingdom. So that, as I was reading the histories of, of what was going on up here, it sounded a lot like that, that you always had too few aircraft where you needed them. And this kind of sums it up that our aircraft has been down in the central part bombing, and just as they're getting traction, they pull them all north and leave only three aircraft down there in the center. Not enough to, uh, to make a difference. And the reason it's not enough to make a difference is because, remember I talked about the trackless forests and all, well, they can't bring armor in there, and it's very difficult to get any artillery in there, so the Stuka is acting as the, the artillery for the infantry. And so instead, they're moved up to the north to support the third attempt to breach the Litza line, and the Litza is a river. So here is the attack. This is the third attack now. Our aircraft has only been participated in this one attempt. The previous two occurred before it got into the theater. And so they bombed concentrations here, uh, Strategic Hill here. This is the Litza River. And then also, if you remember, I pointed out a peninsula that the, that the Finns lost in the uh, Winter War. Well, this is the peninsula right here. And it plays a key role in this part of the, of the battle because the Soviets controlled this and they outflanked the German position. In addition, supplies come in because roads are terrible, there's no railroads. Supplies come in by water to Patsama right here. And the Soviets have erected gun batteries all along the western side of this peninsula. So, in the logbook, Rupke and the, and the Stuka are dive bombing the, uh, the artillery positions on the western side of this peninsula. And then just as soon as they get traction up north, they move them all back down to the center again, to Rovaniemi, in uh, <clears throat> the early part of October. By now, they've captured a, uh, a Soviet town, Alakurdi, and they're able to put in a, a very rudimentary airfield there to help support um, operations over that front. In addition, they're now, the tasking is starting to be more oriented toward the Murmansk Railroad. Instead of supporting the troops, let's sever the railroad. And so you see the type of missions um, being organized are, are against railroad stations and trains themselves. This is a section of the Murmansk Railroad. Louis is here, Kandalashka is here, Murmansk is up here. And it's along in here that this aircraft is making its bombing run. This is the, the Arctic Circle Station right here, and that shows up in the logbook. And this is Chufa, and that shows up in the logbook. And this is Louis right here, and it shows up in the logbook. So in the typical German efficiency, they do a study. What does it take to knock out a railroad track? And they, <clears throat> they determine that the, the light bombs are totally ineffective. Uh, the 110-pound bombs, of which the Stuka can carry two under each um, outer weapons points, um, get a better result, but it's, the damage is too easily repaired. And the larger bomb, the 550-pound the, uh, bomb, produces more lasting damage, but only if you can get it within 10 feet of the, of the actual rails. And in order to keep the bombs from bouncing off the embankments and off the tracks, they come up with a nose spike. And that hopefully, if you've done it right, it will embed in where you dropped it and then explode. Not to be confused with a distance rod, which uh, they also used that would allow the bomb to go off above ground, which would be good for knocking out troops. Here's a look at the types of missions that are recorded for this aircraft against the railroad. So here's Robanyemi, the, the major base. Here's Alakurdi, the new, newly acquired temporary base. And you can see that they would do a, a morning run to Alakurdi. They would uh, refuel and then hit the railroad. Then back to Alakurdi and back to Robanyemi for the night. By December, and it doesn't say this in the logbook, but we can presume based on what we know about the, the climate and everything, this is probably out of commission, snowed over completely. And so you find round trip 
flights from Rovaniemi to the airport, or to the, uh, excuse me, to the uh, railroad. And these are the longest missions that I've seen recorded in, in this fellow's logbook. Those are over three hours long, uh, probably using the drop tanks and a single bomb under the, uh, the center of the fuselage. So they hit the Arctic Circle Station twice in early December. Those are, like I said, three-hour missions. The other missions from Alicurdy are shorter missions. They're only an hour and 20 minutes, and that's the value of having that intermediate base. So in the winter of 41-42, most of the histories say very little air activity occurs over the, the winter. It's, it's dark basically all the time. Uh, it's bitterly cold. However, if you look through the log books, you do see missions here and there. Um, just not the all-out activity that you saw in the summertime. They're probably at Rovaniemi. The reason I say that is because the north is snowed in. If you leave a plane, and some bombers, JU-88s, were snowed in up north on fields. Uh, so we believe that all three squadrons, including this aircraft, were at Rovaniemi over the winter. And during that time, the Germans changed the uh, organization and the fourth Stuka group becomes the first group of uh, Sturzkampfgeschwader or Stuka, Stuka group, a Stuka wing five on the 27th of January, 1942. And because uh, 6234 was in the 12th, and the new group has, the new wing only has uh, one group, it goes into the third, if that makes any sense to you. So the old group had 10, 11, and 12 squadrons, the new group has one, two, and three. And it ends up in the third, the third uh, squadron. There's no change to the to the code on the side of the aircraft at the beginning of the year. Later on, uh, this unit changes the final letter to match up with, with, with the proper coding for squadrons one, two, and three, but they don't change the L1. And the emphasis shifts away from attacking the railroad and shifts away from supporting the troops to attacking the convoys and the port. So by this time, so much stuff has come in uh, that the Germans are, are worried that the Soviets are getting too much uh, benefit from the Allies. And so uh, the tasking now is knock out the port of Murmansk and knock out the convoys. I could find very little evidence of the JU-87s, the Stukas, being used against convoys. Basically, they would have to be just in, in the, uh, the bay there in front of Murmansk before the JU-87s would be used. The JU-88s, the twin-engine bombers were the ones that were going out um, and attacking the convoys out at sea. We have no specific logbook for the first four months in 1942 to go by. So much of what we describe as the history of this aircraft is the history of the group's activities. However, we do know exactly who was in the aircraft when it went down on the 24th of April, 1942. And we know some of the details about that particular day. So the crew on the final mission were Rudolf Newman and Kurt Grafe, and Newman was a very accomplished dive bomber pilot. He, he would eventually amass over 550 missions. He eventually transitioned into a Focke-Wulf 190, uh, but the majority of his missions were in the Stuka. He, he bailed out twice, uh, both up in the, in the far north, and uh, was a decorated uh, Stuka pilot. So the 24th of April, it's a morning mission. It's out of Kirkanus up in the north. Uh, they're going to hit uh, the port of Murmansk. I have the, a Russian history over on the left, and I have the official German uh, daily report on the right. There are some discrepancies, but the basic tone of the, of the mission is the same. Uh, <clears throat> the Germans sent 15 JU-87s with an escort of 24 109s. The, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the Stukas left from Kirkanus and they picked up their escort as they passed over Petsamo and, um, and went on to, to uh, Murmansk. Murmansk was, the, the objective was covered with clouds, so they couldn't attack that, so they diverted to Rostov, which is just to the north of Murmansk, basically a suburb of, of 
uh, northern Murmansk. And they bombed through a little hole in the clouds, according, according to the report. They dropped 15 bombs, so we can assume that all aircraft reached the target. In addition to many, many of the smaller ones, but I'm talking about the main un, uh, bomb under the central fuselage. They were met by Soviet hurricanes. That was the predominant aircraft that the Soviets were flying because of Lend-Lease at that, at that, just at that particular moment. Uh, the, the Germans had one aircraft damaged that came back, one Ju-87, and then one Ju-87 that was lost. And the one that was lost is the one that's, that's behind us here, but it wasn't necessarily lost to enemy activity. The German reports claim engine failure. And at this point, there's nothing in the restoration that's indicated that it wasn't engine failure, that it, that it was shot down. So at some point, uh, Newman loses his engine, Graf bails out, Newman bails out, and Newman survives, and Graf is to this day MIA somewhere in the far north. The aircraft itself comes down to the southwest, just to the west of a lake, and the, the lake's called Shovna. According to the German reports, because they were very, they were very systematic in the way they did this, they had, and in a follow-up report on the 10th of May, so about approximately two weeks after the aircraft goes down, Newman shows up in German lines, so he's made his way back, and there's a little pencil notation on the report that says he survived. This is a Soviet map, and what, we, what I just described was the mission from Kirkenes to Murmansk. They picked up their escort out of Petsamo, which is right here, and the aircraft ended up next to this lake, Lake Shovna. And if Newman could reach, this is the Litza line, if he could reach anywhere in that area, he would be essentially um, in German, behind German lines. Um, it's in just speculation here, but the, the reason he might have ended up down here is if he had gone back this way, he would have gone right over the lines and possibly picked up more um, enemy fire. But by going this way, uh, th there was basically nothing happening down here. So in addition to having 8% of the Stuka uh, fleet here in front of you, you also have some other aircraft that were retrieved from this area in the museum. And that particular aircraft over there, that, that Stuka wing, that was lost on the 28th of May, so a month later, and it came down approximately here. The IL-2, that's over in the other hangar, the Soviet aircraft. It was on a mission against Luistari, which is right here, and it came down somewhere near the Tavotka River here. And then the P-40, which is in the museum, it came down in the Murmansk area, being flown by the Soviets. So you've got at least five aircraft that you're able to walk around today that were all recovered from, from that area. And here is 6234 sitting as it did from 1942 until about 1991 um, to the west of Lake Shovna. This is the, uh, I decided that it would be interesting to look because I've talked about so much about how they had inadequate aviation resources. I said, well, let's take a look at the losses. So this is when Barbarossa begins. This is when 6234 goes down. The, the red line is the cumulative Stuka losses. And if you consider that they never had more than 27 or 28 Stukas in operation, so by, by about the time this aircraft shows up, they've lost almost 100% of their Stukas. And by the time this aircraft goes down, they've almost lost 200% of their Stukas. And while they received, they, the Germans sent more fighters and more twin-engine bombers up to the north 
They never sent more Stukas. They replaced them, but they never sent a second group or anything like that up, up into that area. So what was it like to be a Stuka pilot? And this is from Rudolf Newman, the guy that flew this on the day that it went down. And he says, apart from minor differences, such as the prevailing anti-aircraft and fighter defenses, the missions carried out by our arm, the dive bombers, are invariably the same. It makes it sound like you're just going to your morning job, that is nothing special. But I can, I can believe, though, that it was much more hair-raising than that. He was a master of understatement. And finally, the epilogue for, for uh, both Stukas is uh, written by a German general who was a liaison officer with the Finnish forces, and he was engaged by the Americans to write the history of this campaign after the war. All of the expedients which were employed, namely bombing of railroad bridges and viaducts by the Luftwaffe, frequent air attacks on Murmansk and other railroad stations, demolitions by combat patrols led to no lasting result. Only slight damage was ever inflicted. This the Russians were able to repair after a few hours' work. It kind of puts a, puts a period on the whole, the whole campaign. They just, they just did not put enough resources into this part of it. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to questions later.